Chapter 5, Appearance, Material, and Textures. And this is uh, a great chapter. This shows you how to color things and how to give it uh, uh, different imagery to put over it. So it's going to change our world from uh, gray or black and white to uh, much more interesting rendering. Now there's uh, quite a bit in here, and appearance is a word that we use over and over, and it's a container actually for uh, what are the material properties or the image texture properties that affect corresponding geometry. So appearance, the node, is actually quite simple. It's just containing the color colorization effects that we want to use. and all these other nodes make up the special techniques of how you do that. Okay, so uh, what's it all about? Well, our motivation is to get, uh, get things looking real. And can we make our 3D objects uh, be real enough so that the user is engaged, they feel like, oh yes, this makes sense, I see where I am, I see what I'm supposed to do. Oh, I didn't realize that before. You can get insight <coughs> and act within that world. Okay. Now, to actually achieve that is always a good challenge and uh, always plenty of work. So we'll learn the basics in this chapter, and as we get better at uh, uh, integrating real-world capabilities into our worlds, using models that are high fidelity, we'll see uh, why they work and what we can do to make them look uh, even better. Now, uh, it's easy to forget when we get right into materials and how to draw things that they are affected by lighting. The lighting chapter is later in, in the book, and what it's all about is how do, we, uh, how do we actually build things within a 3D world? Well, it's, it's much like the real world in that it emulates light sources and how they uh, make things visible give them color, make them uh, uh, lit up the way we would in the real world. Okay, sorry, I can't get that. Uh, so what we will assume in this chapter then is that we're using a white light and that it is shining on our object. In our case, it's usually the headlight, the one that follows around the camera, which is by default on, which is why we don't have to turn any lights on. But when we get to chapter 11, we'll see how to do a lot more with that. Okay, because appearance is a container node, holding other nodes together right next to geometry, it's, it's a good time to review that parent-child set of relationships. And if you recall, all the way back from uh, chapter two, it's it's not just appearance that's a parent node here, but it's also the shape node. The shape node is a container that brings a piece of geometry, in fact, I should say a single piece of geometry, and holds it next to the appearance. And then the appearance itself can hold either typically a material, or maybe a two-sided material, or an image texture, or something. Okay. Turns out the uh, parent-child relationship isn't quite done there. Even the textures themselves can contain yet another child beneath them, a texture transform that might move the texture around the imagery on top of the geometry to get it aligned properly. But here's the basic, uh, the basic layout. And I guess what this slide really calls for is, uh, I should add a picture here. No arguments from you guys. I said it, but hopefully clear enough. All right. If, uh, if you wanted a picture right away, of course, you could go to, uh, go to the scene graph. And here we are in the first example. And if we open up the Example right here in the scene graph, we see that there is a shape, and the shape contains an appearance, which in turn contains a material, and then the sphere is a pier of the appearance node. So 
if you want a picture, if you want a diagram of how it works, you can go to essentially any X3D scene, and if it's got a piece of geometry in there, then there must be a shape, there must be an appearance right next to that geometry so that it can be properly rendered. Okay. So what's next? Um, here's something we've seen before, but we'll start to use it even more now, and that's the idea of def and use, where we define a node by giving it a label. I mean, it was already there before. It's, the name might be a little confusing, but uh, once you have a name, you want to ID it, and that you give it a def name, where that defines a name for that node. And subsequent to that, you can make copies of it, copy by reference, simply by naming the node and saying use equals the def name that you gave it originally. Okay, so you could think then, that, oh, if I have a bunch of things in a scene that are the same color or the same material or the same appearance, then a, an efficient technique would be use the same material node for all of those. So that if you decide to change it, you only have to change it in one spot and all of the other use copies occur rapidly and immediately and consistently. Okay, so that can uh, tend to be a, a stylistic thing uh, as well as anything else. Okay, so let's look at some examples then. So this uh, this slide is uh, basically reiterates the same fact that the appearance can contain a material or else a two-sided material node. We'd use two-sided material if we wanted to have different appearance, different material values for both the outside and the inside of a shape. So for example, since we can now see the inside of a sphere or a box, we could make it one color on the outside and one color on the inside. That might be helpful if you were building rooms or wanted to partition or give a sort of a background type of indicator to the user where they were, or were they inside or outside. That's a, a simpler way than trying to make concentric shapes with a single material. This allows us to take advantage of the fact that the graphics card can tell whether you're on the outside of a polygon or the inside of a polygon. So that's why we added two-sided material. Okay, now this slide is a particularly good one to go to the notes on because in those notes we cover the uh, an example of deaf use patterns. Okay, and uh, so you can sort of take your choice when you do it. If you wanted to have the same material values for everything, you could def the material node and then uh, use that material node. But of course, if you're going to reuse a material node, you still have to put an appearance node above it. Okay, so that can get kind of uh, tedious if you're doing it over and over and over again. So you might say, well, instead of defing using the material, why not def and use the appearance node? Because then it's just a simpler one-liner. You could say def use, there's my appearance, over and over again. Of course, this can lead you to a little bit of an error later, uh, which is if you don't use the right, the def and use have to exactly match node for node since it's a copy. And since we have strong typing of nodes, you can't stick an appearance in where a material is expected or vice versa. Okay, so the notes on this slide, uh, currently this is slide 10 in the chapter, uh, points out that a good naming convention is when you def your names, you can put the last name or, or terminate it with, with the name of the node that it is. And that makes it a little bit easier to remember when you def it and use it what exactly it is. Okay, so for example, instead of calling a material foggy glass, and then mistakenly use it as a material or an appearance later, 
it might be better to say, well, this is a foggy glass appearance. And then it's immediately obvious, well, what are we talking about here? Of course, that supports the, the thumb rule about what's a good name. You know you have a good name when nobody asks about it anymore. Because you just use the name and everybody got it. But as soon as somebody says, well, what was that? Well, you go, was that an appearance or was that a material? You go, hmm, that's an indicator right there that my name could probably be improved. Okay, so if you want to learn about that, there's a link in here too to the scene authoring hints and naming conventions, which go over that in some detail. And let's see if my link is working. Okay, there we go. Naming conventions, and so we've spelled those all out right there. You can also read more about that in the book. Okay. So here's a screen snapshot of the uh, appearance mode, and this is our first example. Actually, the first example is diffuse color. We didn't make an, an example for appearance because it's just so simplistic. If you do pull up the editor for this, all you see is def and use. Those are the only attributes on it. It can still contain children. So appearance, appearance is not a trivial note, but it does not have any fields that need value setting. Okay, now since this is still uh, fairly early in the book, I've stuck in a few pages here, a few slides that tell you uh, some more hints about how to use X3D Edit in case uh, this wasn't quite clear. Obviously our, our palette is grouped according chapter by chapter and you can drag and drop and uh, it notes that you don't have default attributes they are omitted for clarity, although you can type them in. However, if you uh, uh, that's often a good practice to type in default values if you're really depending on them. If you want to do it as sort of a visual reminder. Although they might get snapped out of there again by the XML parser because they're not required to keep uh, default values in if not desired. Okay, so here's a, a picture of how you might do that. You can drag and drop a node in. This is probably quite familiar to you guys. That, uh, um, that you can, uh, when you first drag it in, at least for a shape node, there are lots of prompts there on what are the proper nodes to insert where. And then uh, you can just work your way through step by step, replacing each one, chopping out the comments, editing them as they go. Okay. Uh, Let's exercise that a little bit, and sometimes it's fun to exercise it not from how it works, but from how it doesn't work. So let's take an appearance and let's drag and drop that, and let's put that as the first node in the scene. And you should go, wait, 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 that shouldn't work because an appearance must have a shape as its parent. But let's, let's try it anyway. Okay, so what comes up when I drag and drop it there? It says, okay, you want to insert an appearance. Fine. Did you want to give it a def name or did you want to use another name? And then if we say OK, sure enough, when it performs a validation on your change, it says, this didn't pass validation. Are you sure you want it? And so let's go ahead and say, yeah, yeah, we want it. Let's go ahead and put it there and accept. Then let's look at this. Uh, See if I can get the uh, window up properly. Here we go. A little hard to uh, read, but it says the content of element type scene must match, and then it gives a long, 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 long list of all of the allowed nodes. And if you carefully trawl through that, or 
if you just remember, you might say, oh, oh, it's not letting me put an appearance there because it's not allowed content. Okay, so uh, at that point we can just simply uh, undo it and back out again. And our example's back to where it should be. Okay, so let's take a look at the, uh, let's start on the material node then. And if nothing else, just to say how important it is and what the details are, will be covered in the next class. Okay, so material is essentially a uh, color. And you might, you might say, well, why didn't they just call it a color node? But the reason for that is because there are so many different aspects of color that go into the material, into generating the appearance of what uh, a specific piece of geometry looks like. So what are the key parts about this? Well, it could be transparent. It could be glowing. It's uh, something that's applied consistently to all of the geometry that it works on. And if we get, we get strict about it, material is really defining what are the visual properties of a piece of geometry that will interact with any lights that might be talking to it. Okay, so we are uh, going to see some of these properties again when we get up to the lighting chapter in chapter 11. Because material is so fundamental, you do want to uh, master it. So if we look at the first one, the, excuse me, the first example, we see that we do have a material in this scene and it's simply defining a single value and that is for diffuse color. So let's call up the editor for this guy and we see, okay, there's our diffuse color. It's got a value of one, zero, zero, red, green, blue. So if our red component is one, this is a pure red color for diffuse, diffuse color. And so if we click on that editor, we see that we can easily and quickly change what the diffuse color is. Or you can simply type it in, type in the value if you know one. If we pull this uh, editor back up, we can also see if you hit the control key, and now I've just hit control, we can see that the uh, palette changes. It says saturated colors. Let go, we go back to, to this guy. If I hit shift, we see desaturated, sort of lighter or washed out. Uh, then if I hit the alt key, uh, SVG X11, these are, these are considered some of the most uh, the common palette for HTML pages. If I hit, let's see if I can do this now, control alt, then that gives us recent colors. And let's see what else. Shift control is back to that. Okay, and then shift alt gives us systems colors. I guess what's being used by X3D edit and, and the uh, system. Okay, but at the end of the day, it's really just an RGB value, red, green, blue. Uh, we found a little palette widget and plugged it in there, and that's been pretty nice. We can also see when we change this that not only does the value change at the top, right in the line entry, but it changes down below in the uh, window that's showing our example code. So you can sort of get a reinforcement of what the X3D end result actually looks like. Okay, but if I try to get us all the way back to red, that's a little tricky actually just using the, uh, the widget, so the color palette. So I'll just type that back in, and we can see that yes, indeed, that did change. So as we continue on in the uh, material chapter, material note here, we'll see what do these other guys do. If uh, diffuse color is our primary 
material component, which says what's the primary color of an object reflecting light, then emissive color turns out to be how does it look if it's glowing. Specular color says if there are highlights that sharply reflect what's going on, what color would those be? Transparency is whether something you can see through it, transparent, or whether it's opaque, no light gets through it, or something partially transparent, which means we can see it, but we can also see through it. And then uh, ambient intensity is you know another fine tuning on here. There's reflected light, not from direct light sources. What color would it be? And then uh, finally the shininess, how bright, how big those reflected spots would be. You can uh, pick different materials very quickly if you pick one of these guys here and see how that works. Uh, we can pick materials quite rapidly. And our viewer here lets us take a look at how did it change. There's some XYZ axes in there. There's also, uh, we can move the light around. We can also change the background to see if that helps give us a better contrast to see how our material will actually look in context. Okay, so we've covered material, diffuse color, and uh, in the next lesson we will pick up with uh, the rest of the properties of material and then two-sided material.